Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to all those persons who are watching online and to all of us that are here this morning. This is another week that we have begun. This is Monday. And we're so glad to have the sunshine that uh, brings us all together. And we know that God is all around us. And we see the beauty that surrounds us. And we see the trees, believe it or not, that have begun to change and begin to drop their leaves so we know falls around the corner, whether we want it or not. <laughs> so as we come this morning, I want to um, share with you some announcements. This week we have, um, Wednesday night we have Sanctuary in here at 6.30, and then Thursday we have in here at 9 o'clock, okay, and then on Friday we have Vespers at 7 o'clock in here, so at Wednesday after 6, after we have uh, Sanctuary in here from 6.30 to 7.30, and then you can go to the auditorium for an organ concert from 7.30 to about 8.30, quarter to 9 so there's still a lot going on here, yeah. and you can avail yourselves of all of that. Mm -hmm. And also over at the hub, we have all kinds of Bibles and gifts and all kinds of things that you might want to pick up. And if you don't see something that you think that you need or want, please talk to Linda or any of those persons there that are working today. Uh, they're hoping to help you out in anything that you might want to need. So I think that there are... Um, there's prayer at the rail every morning here at 8.30. You're welcome to come and uh, kneel here at the rail with Mary Martin, mm -hmm. and she will lead in prayer. Any prayer concerns that you have, um, and I know that we have a lot of prayer concerns yeah. in our daily lives that we can turn to God and uh, do that here at the rail every morning at 8.30. So avail yourselves of that. Um, there are other items and things that are going on. There is... Um, in Grove Hall in uh, December, there is a seminar going on there. I believe it's the 12th of December. Um, and then in February, there will also be another seminar. So there will be more information um, for the rest of this week about those two items that are coming up. So I think that's the end of the announcement. So we will come then into worship. Hear these words. The greatest disease in the, in the West today is not tuberculosis, leprosy, or even COVID-19 that we are going through right now, but rather it is being unwanted, unloved, and uncared for. Hear these words from Psalm 105, verses 1 through 4. Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make note among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all of his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Amen. Let us pray. Mm -hmm. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, we just come before you this morning. Give you thanks for this day that you have awoken us to and all the beauty that surrounds us. We thank you for family, we thank you for friends, we thank you for sunshine, we thank you for all the blessings that you bestow upon us each and every day. We ask, O oh Lord, for those persons who are not able to be with us this morning or for whatever reason, that you be with each and every one of them. Be with those persons, O oh Lord, this day who are under the weather and trying to get back up on their feet. And we know, O oh Lord, that we can call upon you and you are there to help us to help heal us. Be with those persons in nursing homes all across the United States, oh Lord, yeah. that we just need to be mindful of who they are and where they are, and that they're never alone, that we care about them in their absence from us. And so, Lord, we just ask that you be with them. Help them each hour and each minute of each day. Be with us this day, oh Lord, as we continue this hour of worship, that they be meaningful to us and us to you. Also pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Let us stand, and we're going to sing our first hymn, which is Messages, written by Marcia Hendren, who's uh, living now in North Carolina, and uh, she wrote this, so let's stand and sing it partly.
morning we have opportunity to be able to give back unto God a portion of who we are and what we're all about. And God is such a big giver to all of us. And so as we give of ourselves this morning, we are here physically. We also have the opportunity to be able to give financially and in other ways, in many, many forms of ministry. So as you depart from here today, there are baskets in the back and there are baskets up front here that you have the opportunity to be able to give in any of those baskets as you depart. So if we're able to give, let us now be able to go to God and give thanks for that offer. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, we just come before you this morning giving you thanks for all that it is that you give unto us. That we are so grateful, Lord, for who you are and what you do in our lives. And without you, we are nothing. And so we are here, O oh Lord, to sing your praises, to be able to hear your word, to give thanks for who you are. To be with us through this hour of worship, O oh Lord, and we give you thanks. This morning, I invite Reverend David Cotton to come and give us the word this morning. David has been here many, many times here in this uh, part of Ocean Grove. He's been on the trustees here, and he has been the former chaplain at uh, Jersey Shore uh, Hackensack uh, Hospital. And he has recently retired, but I'm sure he's not uh, retired. <laughs>
and all of lives and property. And we pray for our, the Gulf Coast states that you will protect them and give them, give them security and, and give them warning. And we pray for Haiti and the Dominican Republic and, and Puerto Rico and the, the islands that have been so inundated with rain from the storms. Lord, with, with few resources, we just pray your, your blessing over them. So, so be with them and hear our prayers in the precious and strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you for letting me share that. I, I believe that something very special happens when we pray together. Amen? Amen. I mean, God wants us to pray individually and go off by ourselves as Jesus did, but I believe in God's word that there's this synergy that happens when we pray together. So can you hear me all right? Is the yes. microphone okay? And uh, I was in the ocean a, a, a few days ago, and, and I got water in my ear, and I'm still carrying a bit of the Atlantic Ocean in my ear, so I can't tell whether you can hear or not, so you have to let me know, all right? So I appreciate that. It's the end. It's the last moments that Jesus will spend with his disciples in his human body. They've had dinner together. They've done the Passover. He's amazed them with the introduction of newness to the meaning of the Passover, which for 1,500 years has been scripted like nothing else is scripted. Ever do the Passover? Ever do the Seder? It's scripted. There's you, the father says this, the oldest son says that, right? Can I get a Presbyterian head nod, even if you're Methodist? Right? It's, it's very scripted. And Jesus has made it about himself. So this is my body. This is my blood. God is having dinner with you. God, whose faithfulness you're celebrating in the Passover, is here in the flesh with you. That's done. And Judas has left. And only Jesus really understands why he has left. And then, Jesus brings something brand new. For 1,500 years, there have been 10 commandments, right? Yes. You know them. We know them. We're pretty good with most of them. Maybe all of them. But Jesus says this. A new command I give you. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what the disciples were thinking and feeling? A new command? There aren't any new commands. There are ten commands. A new command I give you. Love one another. And then, after giving this new command, love one another, Jesus, he, he explains it and, and he, he, he embellishes it. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. So he, he, he explains it. He says, love one another, and here's the way you do that. You love one another the way I have loved you. And then, after giving one new command, he gives one characteristic that he expects from his followers. One. By this, by this, the this is love one another as I have loved you. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples Amen. if you love one another. A new command after 1,500 years. It sounds simple. It's like everything from Jesus, isn't it? It doesn't sound very complicated. <laughs> you know, I was a school principal in my previous life, so I have what I call my principal voice.
voice. Okay, <laughs> so I worked in this bike shop uh, for a while in the summers, and uh, um, they were used to me as sort of the mild mannered guy that, that did the sales and so forth. And there, a couple of kids sort of started to fight by the front door, and I said, "Hey!" And they were like, "Oh, where did that come from?" I said, "That's it's my teacher voice. <laughs> my teacher voice. No, I can use my teacher." Voice. So, I'm a Jesus follower. That's who I want to be. That's who I want to be when I stand in front of Jesus and say, here I am, Lord. I want Jesus to say, you are a follower. Because Jesus didn't ask us just to believe. He asked us to follow. Come on. Yes, amen. He asked us to follow him. And my, my passion in life is to be the best Jesus follower I can be and to, to, to learn every day what it means to be a Jesus follower. And I believe that this is where we start. We start with Jesus' definition of a Jesus follower. And that is, love one another as he has loved us. And so that's what I really want to talk about this week. I want to talk about how do we fulfill that commandment? How do we honor that commandment? How do we follow that commandment from Jesus? Because there's only one. And there's only one main characteristic that Jesus looks for. So it's not that hard, but yet everything from Jesus seems not that hard and then gets very complicated later on, right? Come on. Yes. All right? Because it's easy. It's, it's simple to say love one another until you meet somebody who ain't lovable. <laughs> and until you realize when Christ brings it to you and you look in the mirror that maybe you ain't that lovable. All right? So let's look at how, how, what does it look like to love one another as Jesus loved us. So each each, in each encounter with Jesus, I want to start with, how does Jesus love us? And then I want to move toward, how did Jesus display that kind of love? And then, how do we apply that kind of love in our own lives? So I want to do a three-part in each, and I want to bring these encounters with Jesus to demonstrate how he loves us, how he demonstrated that love, and then talk about how we can love one another in that same way. So, have you ever, have you ever been busy and tired and frazzled and needed to get away? Amen. <laughs> and God brings to you someone who needs your help. And you know that you should help. And you're tired. Did I mention you're tired? Did I mention you're frazzled? Did I mention you just want to get away? Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. Three days. He's been preaching for three days. Do you know what it's like to 
preach for three and a half minutes? <laughs> You're worn out. You know what saint stands for? Sunday afternoon is nap time. <laughs> That's what saint means to preachers, because when you're done preaching, you go home, and my, my phrase for my family is, I'm going to go change my clothes. I'm going to go change my clothes. <laughs> and an hour later, <laughs> I emerge. Jesus has been teaching for three days, and he realizes that all the people are hungry, and he can't send them home hungry, and he has compassion on them. And so do the disciples. Oh, wait. <laughs> Verse 4. His disciples answered, But where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground, and when he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and they did so. <laughs> They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks for them and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 men were present. And having sent them away, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmanutha. Well, the Pharisees came and began to question Jesus, to test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. Can you imagine? He just fed 4,000 people <laughs> with a couple of loaves of Wonder Bread and a few cans of Bumblebee tuna, and they're saying, why don't you do a trick for us? <laughs> and Jesus sighed deeply. <laughs> I don't you love it? That Jesus is in a human body, people. You know? He did what we ought to do when somebody says something that ridiculous to us. He takes a deep breath. And he doesn't hit sin. <laughs> he takes a deep breath and says, Why does this generation ask for a miraculous sign? I tell you the truth. No sign will be given to it. And then he left them, got back into the boat, and crossed to the other side. Hmm. Jesus had compassion on them. Jesus loves with compassion. Not with canceling. You know the cancel culture? Do you know that term? The cancel culture? We seem to be in a day where if somebody says something or does something or believes something that we don't agree with, Done. Done with that. But if we as followers of Jesus want to love one another as Jesus loves us, then we need to look at Jesus and how he demonstrates that. So let's take a look at a couple of examples of how Jesus demonstrates how he loves us. Will you turn with me to, to Matthew chapter, no, let's do Luke first. Luke chapter 4. Beginning with verse 38. Luke 4, 38. The Gospel according to Luke, chapter 4, beginning with verse 38. You with me? Yes. So Jesus has just driven out an evil spirit in the synagogue on the Sabbath. He loved to do that. <laughs> because it made the Pharisees crazy. And he's demonstrating what love looks like. Love looks like a person. It doesn't look like a rule. It doesn't look like a law. Love looks like the person in front of you. And they were so wound up that, that he would do something nice because it was the Sabbath, because the rule and the law was more important than the person, but never, ever for Jesus. So Jesus left the synagogue, verse 38, and went to the home of Simon. 
You know, we know whose time it is, right? It's pre, pre Peter, right? Now, Simon's mother in law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her, and she got up at once and began to wait on them. When the sun was setting, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people, shouting, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew he was the Christ. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogue of Judea. This is the word of the Lord. So Jesus leaves the synagogue and, and all of the rabble, and, and he just needs to get back and rest, and he goes to Simon's home, and, and this is where we find out that Simon was married, because he had a mother-in-law, right? I mean, it comes along with being married. It's not something you seek. <laughs> Monday and I've gone 15 minutes and already I have something to apologize for, but that's okay. So he goes to Simon's home and, and his mother-in-law is there and we think, well, she had a fever, big deal. Do you realize how short the time is that a fever didn't mean that you could die? It hasn't been that long. It wasn't long ago that having a fever meant, oh my God, this could be death. Because if you got pneumonia, there were no ventilators. There were no antibiotics. And so when, when, when we read this, I mean, I've spent a big portion of my life, 26 and a half years, working in a hospital. And this is his mother-in-law. This is his family. And everybody is somebody's family. Amen. It's a message that I kept giving to the residents because I had this wonderful opportunity to teach the young doctors. And they graduate from medical school, they're an MD. But they have to work for three years in the hospital under supervision before they can take their medical boards and go off on their own. So in the beginning, they know just enough to make them really dangerous. <laughs> But they're wonderful, and they're lovely, and they listen. And I always taught them, that person in front of you is someone's most important person. Amen. It might be the next patient for you, but it's somebody's mom, or somebody's brother, or somebody's beloved child. Does Jesus need to heal his mother-in-law? Does Peter ask him to heal his mother-in-law? Jesus has compassion. And then he goes off and, and he tries to get away by himself and everybody comes looking for him. And he goes healing and touching. He touches people. That's what Jesus does. He touches them with compassion. When he was in his human body, he touched them with his hands. And now, for you and for me, he touches us with his word. Amen. He touches us with his presence. He touches us with the power of the Holy Spirit. He touches us with living inside of us and giving us that chill when we know that we have heard him. And we can feel his touch if we tune in. Amen. You can still feel that touch of compassion. Jesus loved with compassion. Matthew tells us a little bit more about that. Sometimes you, it's 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 fun to look at the different gospel writers' version of the same event because they see it through different eyes, right? I mean, if you and someone you're with go to the same thing and you review it afterwards, you don't both say the same words, right? I mean, you see it through different eyes. So let's look at Matthew chapter 8 just for a moment. Chapter 8, beginning 
beginning with verse 14. 814. When Jesus came into Peter's house, so Matthew calls him Peter, right? He doesn't start off by calling him Simon. He calls him Peter. Remember that? When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she got up and began to wake him. Don't you love it? She, yeah, she's, you know, my, my mother and mother-in-law are like that. They would, if you were in their house, they were going to take care of you. Come on. You know somebody like that. We have the gift of hospitality, right? Huh? Who just takes care of you. You can go in and, and you don't have to ask for anything. They just take care of you. So Jesus heals her. And then when evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him. And he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. And this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our, our infirmities and carried our diseases. And that's important for us to know, to remember that as the prophets told us what the Messiah would be and who the Messiah would be, they said that he will take your stuff on him. That's how Jesus loves. All right, let's look at one more opportunity and one more encounter with Jesus, the compassionate one who loves us with compassion. Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. Beginning with verse 11. Luke 7, 11. <laughs> Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. You know, I don't... That every time Jesus went, you know, Jesus, that there's a crowd that, that, that's following along with him. And as he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out. He never buried anybody inside the town gates. The only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. And he said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. <laughs> I guess so, right? I mean, that would stop everything. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us. They said, God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. If you're a widow in the first century and your only son dies, your life as you know it is over. You have no means of earning an income. You have no support. You don't own anything. You're in serious trouble. And Jesus sees this funeral procession. I shared this scripture with the, the youth group at one point. And they, I saw them looking at me and, and they are like, so he was in the coffin and he sat up. And I said, okay, guys, it's like a basket. It's like a basket, and he's wrapped in a sheet. He's wrapped in the, the, the cloths that they put around you, but it's not a coffin like we think of a coffin, okay? It's not that kind of coffin. So when he sits up, and Jesus sees her and is filled with compassion. She's nobody to him, but she's everybody to him. She's not related. She doesn't have anything to do with him. She hasn't been following him. She's not a believer. But he has compassion on her and stops everything and raises her son from the dead. So how do I love as Jesus loves me? I love with empathy. I love with compassion. Compassion is an English word.
word that comes from a Greek prefix and a Greek word. Calm is with, and passion is to feel. And so when you have compassion, when I have compassion, we feel with that person. We put our heart. Did you, did you hear that Jesus' heart went out to her? Isn't that an awesome phrase? Amen. His heart went out to her. Man, that gives me the chills, literally. It's 150 degrees in here, and I've got chills. <laughs> because his heart went to her. He felt, in, 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 in Greek, in, in, the, in the first century, your heart is not like the hallmark touchy-feely kind of heart that we think of today. Your, 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 your heart is where you made your priorities and where you made your decisions and where you decided what was important. And she became the most important thing. He's on his way someplace else, but she is not a distraction. She is not an interruption. She is the most important person on the earth because his heart went out to her. There are lots of people who pass through our lives. Amen? Amen? There are lots of people that we encounter as Jesus encountered her. And we can do one of two things. We can pay attention or we can ignore them. We can see them or we can be blind to them. We can look at only what we want to look at, or we can look for opportunities to love one another as Jesus loved us. I'm concerned about our culture today because there's so much anger and so much division and so much in or out, yes, or no, right? Good or bad. Come on. We there's this division spirit, and we as followers of Jesus can't let ourselves get sucked into that. Amen. If we're going to love one another as Jesus loves us, we need to have compassion for all. Whether they agree with us or not, whether they look like us or not, whether they vote like us or not, whether they worship like us or not, if we're going to be followers of Jesus and follow his one command and live up to the one characteristic that was most important to him, we, our hearts, need to not stay right in here and only come out <laughs> when somebody we like is around. When somebody who agrees with us is around. But we, our hearts need to go out. And we need to notice people. And we need to care about people. And we need to feel for people. We need to empathize with people. Because that's how Jesus loves you and me. Amen. He cares about what's important to you. I hear some people sometimes think what say, well, I, I don't think I should pray about that because I, I don't, I, I, that's, that's, Jesus has got bigger things to worry about. No, he doesn't. He cares about what you care about because his heart goes out to you and to me. So our hearts need to go out. Amen? So Jesus loves with compassion. Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 43. Matthew 6, 43. Get it and then look up. All right, Cotton. I'm supposed to have compassion. My heart's supposed to go out. But what about the person who's my enemy, who does me wrong? Not just the average person, not just the person I'm supposed to notice, but the person who's against me. I'm glad you asked that question. Because Jesus has an answer. Matthew chapter 6. I'm 43. 
Yes, no, no, that's that's not right. Yeah. Is it the 34? 34, do I have dyslexia? Luke or Matthew? It's 5, sorry, it's 543. It's not 643, it's 543. Forgive me, 543. So, so this is Jesus talking. This is in the red. I love the red. Does your Bible have Jesus' word in, words in the red? Yes. Yeah. It's where the term rubric comes from. Rubric. Because it's the word for red. So. You have heard it that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons and daughters of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Not even the tax are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. I auditioned for a job at a church to teach Bible study once, and I said in my in my interview, I, there are some things in the Bible that I wish weren't there. <laughs> and that got their attention. And of course, they said, uh, what kind of Bible study teacher are we going to hire who doesn't like things that are in the Bible? I don't like this. I don't like this. Because I don't want to love my enemies. I don't want you. The little two-year-old tantrum. Want to do that? You can't make me do it. <laughs> and he doesn't make us do it, but he calls us to do it, Amen. and he does. And remember, look up here. Remember, you and I were enemies before we were saved. You and I were enemies before he died. When he died. Mm -hmm. So us and them just doesn't work. But it feels good having a name. <laughs> Come on. Just a little bit of righteous. Because when I'm angry at you, it's righteous indignation. <laughs> when you're angry at me, it's, it's unbelievable. Just I can't hear. Well, how could you possibly? <laughs> but when I'm angry at you, it's righteous in the day. Right? Right? When you're angry at me, I want grace. When I'm angry at you, I want truth. <laughs> Love your enemies. It can't be any clearer. I wish it were not so clear, but it's clear. Right? Mark Twain said, it isn't the stuff in the Bible that I don't understand that bothers me. It's the stuff that I do. <laughs> So let's look at what Luke tells us that Jesus did. Let's see if I can get the right chapter on this one. Luke chapter 9, or 5, or 8, or Chapter 9, beginning with verse 51. Luke 9, 51. <clears throat> you with me? 9, 51. Yes. As the time approached for him, meaning Jesus, to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. We love the King James that said he set his face for Jerusalem. Sometimes the, the King James has some beautiful language that, uh, that we, we hate to see disappear. Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem, and he's going there to die. Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. They're, they're taking the shortcut. 
right? Come on. Usually when you go from Galilee to Jerusalem, you, you go east, you go down the Jordan River, you get to Jericho, and you come across and you go up to Jerusalem. They take the bypass. My dad loved the bypass. When I was riding in the car with my dad when I was a teenager, my dad would bypass anything. All right? And I'm thinking, Dad, just go straight through and get there. But he's going through Samaria, and, and they don't like the Samaritans much, and the Samaritans don't like them. And he sends the guys on ahead to say, let's find a Motel 6 for us, and uh, let's find a place to stay. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. Because he's Jewish. And he's going to Jerusalem. And they don't want tourists. They don't want people from New York who don't live there to be in their town away. Is it getting hotter in here? <laughs> they didn't welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? Huh? Come on! Don't you love these guys? I love the disciples so much! Because there's hope for us. Because he chose them. What a bunch of guys. They're just guys, ladies. They're just guys. And all of the worst and best qualities that guys can have, it's like, they did us wrong. Come on. Let's call down huh, the Scud missiles and just... Because that's, right, that's their humanness talking. Jesus called human beings to follow him. And Jesus said, yeah, I can make that happen. <laughs> but Jesus turned and rebuked them. And they went on to another village. He didn't incinerate them. He didn't go and put a curse on them. He just moved on. Clearly, they were enemies. But he didn't punish them. And he never, ever, look here, he never, ever used his power to punish people. Never. He never grabbed on to the power of being God to punish people who were not godly. All right. Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. And then look up. You've got to have context, right? I don't believe in doing scripture without context. Jesus has just finished the Sermon on the Mount. The one where he says you have to love your enemies. That one. Okay? You with me? He's just made all of those points. You know, blessed, blessed are you. I'm not sure why we say blessed there. And we never say blessed any other time. You know why? Blessed, blessed. I don't say, you know, have a blessed, I don't know. Have a blessed day. I don't know. But he's done all the blessings, or blessed, and he's made this, this huge pronouncement of how we should live. And one of those pronouncements is that we should love our enemies. Have you ever made a pronouncement and then the next thing that happens is something to test that? A couple of days ago, we went to the beach, and, and I'm from Ohio. My wife came to Ohio to go to college and met me there. I did not grow up with sand between my toes. And I am a, a how, am I, can, how can I find a word? I am a reluctant going in the ocean when it's cold and I'm hot person. But I said, this summer, I'm turning over a new leaf, and every time I go to the beach, I'm going in the water. Every time. I'm going to go in the water. Because there were other times, many times, that I would go to the beach, but not go into the water. And don't you know, the next time I went to the beach, I really, really didn't want to go into the water. 
there was this south wind, and, and I was kind of cold to begin with. But I just made that pronouncement. Jesus just said, you have to love your enemies, and the next person he meets is a Roman centurion. Right, one right after the next. Now, a Roman centurion is not some poor schlub who got conscripted into the army and got drafted and had to. This is a professional soldier. This is a guy who rose through the ranks because of his valor, because of how efficient of a killer he is. And he's become a centurion. It would be sort of the equivalent of a captain in today's military. And he has anywhere from 80 to 100 Roman soldiers under his command. And 80 to 100 Roman soldiers means that all of the people who supported the Roman soldiers are under his command as well. He's rough, and he's tough, and he's brutal. And he is the enemy. Because he doesn't belong. He conquered their land by force, the land that God gave them. Don't you love it? You just got done saying love your enemies, and here's this God. Here we go. Matthew chapter 8, beginning with verse 5. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Can you imagine what the disciples were thinking about that? <laughs> Matthew doesn't tell us what they said or what they were thinking, but you can imagine what they might have been thinking. A centurion came and asked him for help. Lord, he said. Now that was like sir. You know, he's, Jesus is not his Lord. He doesn't use the word Lord the way we do, but sir. My servant lies at home paralyzed and in terrible suffering. And Jesus said to him, who do you think you are asking for me for help? Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. Boom. Just like that. Why? Because Jesus lives his work. Jesus loves with compassion. Jesus loves without limits. Jesus loves and doesn't see people as good and bad. In and out. The centurion replied, Lord, I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes and that one come and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished. Can you imagine what it takes to astonish Jesus? He came from heaven. There aren't very many times in Scripture where it says that Jesus is astonished, but Jesus is astonished that this man, this rough, mean killer, is, is honoring him by saying, I know I don't deserve to have you come under my life. Jesus was astonished and said to those following him, I tell you the truth. That, that's what Jesus says when he wants you to really listen. Hmm? You know why you have a middle name, right? So that you could tell when you're in trouble. Right? When my mother would say, David Bruce, I was like, no, no, I would snap the attention, all right? So, I, I agree. He says, I tell you the truth. I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, it will be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that very hour. So, Jesus does not see the centurion as a category. That was Amen. Amen. <laughs> Right? Come on. To me, I had not. Jesus does not see the centurion as a category. He is a person. 
a child of God, made in the image of God. He doesn't see all of the things that separate him from the centurion. He sees the beating heart of a child of God who's lost. My sisters and my brothers, there are only two categories in Jesus' world, saved and lost. And we, what do we do when someone's lost? Do we exile them? Do we cancel them? Do we punish them? Do we chastise them? No. We search for them. We drop everything, right? Come on. We look for them and, and care for them and we put up their picture and we put out the alerts. Jesus didn't see the centurion as an enemy. He saw him as lost. And his approach to the lost was love with compassion. And the approach to the lost that Jesus calls for from us is exactly the same. Love one another as he loves us. There's more. I love commercials that say, but wait, there's more. I don't have a free set of steak knives for you, but if you come back tomorrow, there will be more. Okay? God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.